It's the month of March, and this month, Streaming Things is brought to you by Chester Copperpot, Trey Barrera, Conrad, Luke and Sarah, Dave Malfara, Rabbit Dog in a Barbie Car, Jose Ruben Cruz Rodriguez, Thomas Alexander, Emmy, Joe Velez, Valerie, Stanton Valentino, Aaron Layton, Crystal Trujillo, John Collins Ghost, Andrew Gray, Jen Robinson, Kate, Chloe Richardson, Kalisha Reeves, Kiki Newton, Kevin Strother, Jeanette Murphy, Casey McCain, and Enza. Welcome back. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things Continuing and Ending oh, for Now. No. Our coverage of The Last of Us Season 1 on HBO Max. This time, it's a mailbag. <gasps> mailbag. We got dozens and dozens of great emails, maybe mm. hundreds. Nay, <laughs> maybe hundreds. You don't know. We're not sharing those numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I just want people to know that if we didn't read your email on the air, it does not mean it was not a good email or a conversation starter. Uh, at a certain point, I just kind of had to to pick and choose. At a certain point, you just got to give up and say, fuck it. I'm going to stay with what I got. Right. It's like mm-hmm. getting married. Um, so endure and survive. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke, but you didn't laugh and it made it sound like <laughs> I have a really cynical view of love. But we know that Steve loves love. I love love. Uh, burr, 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 burr. Burr, burr, burr. Full disclosure. This is the case every time. If you only listen to our Last of Us coverage, you only get to hear us loopy as shit after we've been <laughs> podcasting for eight straight hours. Yeah, we started podcasting at 4 p.m. today. It's it 10. is now 10 p.m. But even before that, I'm like prepping the emails and yeah. watching and taking notes and stuff. Yep. So it's an all day venture. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm losing my mind. But I do have <laughs> I do have about 20, 25 great emails we're going to try to get through here to wrap up our coverage while we wait the long wait. But I do want to say before two. we before we get into it today, today, I know we said last week was the last week. Today is legitimately the last day you can get a pills baby shirt or a Tony time shirt. We extended it because so many people bought some. Yeah. So we decided to extend it a little bit more just in case someone didn't meet the cutoff time. So literally today, as you're listening to this on Friday is your last day. Go to the store. It's in the show notes. Pick up one now if you so desire. And I put it in the link tree. If you're, if you find me on TikTok or if you, um, you know, follow us on, on Twitter or Instagram or anything like that, the link tree's there. Uh, and you can click the merch store there. We're not trying to hard sell you. We're just anybody that wants one. Uh, yeah. You will never be able to get one if you don't get it today. Right. Um, but we got some cool Yellow Jackets merch. I'm so excited about the Yellow Jackets the merch. Yeah, it looks great. Be sure to tell me when I can like post that on Instagram because I'm really proud of that shirt. Yes. Uh, I'll talk to you about it off air. Awesome. <laughs> wink, wink. But also like, yeah, we've really enjoyed our Last of Us coverage. But, you know, if you're really attached to that show as we are. Don't fret, Boba Fett. Don't fret, Boba Fett. Uh, we are doing the Yellow Jackets coverage, but even if you're not necessarily invested in that show, maybe you don't want to. I, I understand a lot of people are just really, really hesitant to get another streaming service like Showtime. I really do think it's a, a, an excellent show. However, don't worry. You can still listen to our podcast because we've got lots of other like movies and stuff coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. A lot of patron voted content yeah. is finally going to be getting the attention it so desperately deserves um, very soon because we're only going to be following. Next week. For the first time in a while, we're only talking about one show. Mm-hmm. So we can use all that extra time that we'd normally be talking about the second show to do Patreon stuff. Awesome. I can't wait. I'm really excited to see some of these films. Some of them I've never seen before. So very excited. Yeah. And most of those films will also be on the main feed. Um, so that is relevant to a lot of people. Yeah. The the, the chosen episodes will be main feed episodes. Uh, the Patreon poll ones obviously are patron specific episodes yes. but the chosen episodes that we're talking about like your class action park your uh willy walk in the chocolate factory your grind your tombstone, Ooh, tombstone. Uh, those will be the matrix main feed the matrix those will be main feed episodes yes and our patreon poll if you didn't listen to the yellow jackets coverage the winner was twister twister so for march uh steve and i will have to watch and uh review twister here very soon mm-hmm. very soon we might have a special guest we're not sure i'm gonna ask madison uh, since she loves Twister so much, if she wants to sit in she on that one. She geeked out when she found yeah, out. Yeah, she's got to come to the Twister coverage, right? 
Um, but anyway, let's dive right in. Um, those of you who didn't email or maybe didn't know how, you can email streamingthingspod at gmail.com at any time to email us stuff like this and maybe get it read onto the show. Uh, if nothing else, we always do read it. You can also go to patreon.com slash streaming things if you want to join in on those polls we were talking about and other cool rewards. Cool. Damn it. Uh, let's dive right in. Our first email comes in from. Where's it coming in from, Chris? Uh, Where's it coming from? Here's why I got confused. Oh, I don't want to talk about this one first. You know what? I will. Oh, you know, should we address some elephant in the room? Uh, that Jimmy's not here. Who the fuck is Jimmy? Who the fuck is Jimmy? Not Andy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. Jimmy's not here. Yeah. He's not feeling well. So hope he feels better very soon. We miss him. I just kept rolling. A lot of people are so used to just me and Steve. We're the two constants in this math equation. This is true. And there's an X. There's an equals X chair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who the f is Jimmy? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but no, this first email, the reason I got confused is because it's mostly a video and I couldn't remember why I included this in the mailbag. And then I did. It comes in from Miranda. <laughs> Thank you so much for reminding me about this. Essentially, it's an alternate ending. Have you seen this? Oh, um, with the, the singing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to talk about that. For anybody that doesn't know, uh, look look up The Last of Us on YouTube, the alternate ending. Um, I think it's an IGN posted it. Uh, on Yes, I believe so. And, and the whole shtick is that um, Merle Dandridge, who plays Marlene, was asked to kind of prank Troy Baker, who played Joel, uh, in the last, literally filming the last most desperate scene in the game that you did see in the show where he shoots the the, the doctors and stuff. Yeah, it's when he, when Joel and um, Marlene are like kind of, she's like, put her down, she'll she'll get killed at some day, but we can save humanity, that whole thing. And yes. he like puts the gun down. Well, in the game, at that time, the way they had filmed it was that Marlene would come into the doctor's part, right? Yeah, yeah. And so uh, he asked her to sing, but he went to Troy Baker and he said, no matter what happens, play the scene through, no matter what. And he's like, okay, okay, okay. So she starts singing like, don't do this, Joe. <laughs> but she's a beautiful singer, like, like theater. They both stuff. are. Yeah, they're both like Broadway level good. And Troy just looks for a long time. He's so confused. And he's like, but I have to say, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so funny. It's two fucking theater kids. Just like, fuck it. We're doing this. <laughs> my, my favorite part of that is like towards the end, like after he has shot Marlene, he starts going, dun, 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 dun. he like gives him his own music. Yeah, he starts and singing his own music. And he does like these herky jerky, like musical type movements. Your brain is worth more than life than dead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so good. It's amazing. Yeah. If you haven't seen that, it's well worth your time. It's really fun. And just the most am am amazing part of that is she comes out, Merle Dandridge comes out hot. Yes. Like she comes out belting this song. Get away from her! Get away! You can't save her Even if you get her out of here What then? What then? You can see Troy Baker's eyes kind of open up like what the fuck is happening but he never actually breaks. He never no, goes into a no. smile and you can it, see like it a, takes uh, him a second for the the gears to catch up but once it does like he starts singing and it becomes this whole beautiful thing. He never thing. laughs, never breaks but he is like uh Yeah. You can see a, a production assistant in the background like snickering yeah um but other than that everybody's just like we're professionals even the dude that Run he's taken hostage yeah. is like n not selling it he's like fuck it yeah i'm a hostage love that i love theater kids <laughs> so thank you miranda for reminding me about that um the next email comes in from jill k and jill k is a longtime friend of the show love jill steve you calm down you leave jill alone but we are going to talk about the giraffe okay oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Chris, Steve, and not Andy, JK, Jimmy. Um, he's not here either. Uh, Who I just, the is Jimmy? <laughs> I just wanted to take a second and say how much I love your show. Been a longtime listener, oh, but I'm now a Patreon subscriber. Thank oh, you wow. so much. That's anyway, awesome. thanks for all you guys do. My boyfriend and I look forward to your show every week and even watch Yellow Jackets because of you guys. I hope you're liking it. Any hoozle that's in the email. I have two questions <laughs> and comments about the finale of The Last of Us. The first is just a surprise, even for me. When we watched the show, we felt the same way about the shitty CGI for the giraffe and thought it would be so easy to get a real giraffe. I mean, you can feed one at the Cincinnati Zoo, people. Well, surprise. Ooh, she's from Cincinnati. I guess, yeah. It, it is actually a nationally famous zoo as well. Mm -hmm. It was a real giraffe. The CGI was only in the background and a real giraffe named Nabo was used now i'm gonna pause here before i let steve off his leash and let you guys know we got thousands 
of these messages in one form or another. Yeah. I, I make uh, TikTok recaps um, and they do pretty well. Typically thousands of fucking people. Did you know it was a real giraffe? Not did the, you know not, it was a real giraffe? I'm not mimicking Jill. I'm mimicking yeah. trolls because I did a three minute video and that was like a tiny comment that I made. I didn't say the giraffe's CGI was bad. I said in my video, the CGI in that sequence was subpar to me. In an episode I overall gushed about, right? right? I'm never like the Marvel CGI is so bad. Look at She-Hulk guy ever. I love <laughs> visual effects employees. I'm sure it's hard. I don't even know what they do. It's wizardry, but I can't be dishonest. Mm -hmm. Are you accusing me of being dishonest about what looks a certain way to my fucking eyeballs? Yeah. Now, Jill, again, before I let Steve off his leash, we are aware. <laughs> I'm like a mad dog over here. We are aware the giraffe is real. Thank you for bringing it to our attention because there was a lot of these emails too. There is so much VFX in that sequence. So much that that real, very real, lovely giraffe is composited into an entirely fake world. And if that doesn't look good in a couple of the scenes, that's okay to point out. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve, go. I'm going to go. I'm going to one step further on that. Bear Chris. down. That is, I'm going to bear it out, <laughs> a different show. Uh, that is a very real draft. Yes. Thank you to everyone who let us know. We love Nobu. We stand him. Uh, but I will say. It's where Queen Amidala is from. Head. The giraffe's head is real. Everything else from its jowls down is fake. And it looks fake. In <laughs> fact, I think I remember in the episode when we talked about it, we called out one shot specifically, and that is the shot when the draft turns and goes to Ellie. And it's a wider shot uh, upon reviewing it again. Um, but it's a wider shot. And because just the head is real and in the wide shot, that draft's head is maybe 10% of that CGI composited shot. It does not look good. That shot is not a good looking shot. And yeah, the, the again, the draft's head looks great. Everything down, not background, not. And so I think we're still justified in saying like, like it's kind of funny when people are like, oh, that's a real giraffe. The CGI, it's not CGI. It's mostly CGI. Well, the thing <laughs> that I always kind of my retort, because I got a lot of Twitter DMs, Instagram DMs, and I was always nice to everybody. I understand it's funny because there was a lot of like trolley type people shitting on the show because of the quote unquote fake giraffe. And so a lot of people were just used to being like, it's actually a real giraffe. Yeah. Idiot. Um, that's fair. <laughs> yeah, that is fair. But it's like Chris Hemsworth is real, but it doesn't mean him as Thor flying through space can't look like shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, that's all we were trying Chris to say. Chris Hemsworth is real, but when he was stripped naked in Thor Love and Thunder, that was CGI uh, enhancements to him. Mm. That wasn't just Chris Hemsworth. Those cheeks were real. Buff. Though. It was all meat. <laughs> I'm telling you. That tattoo was real, too. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but I like, again, I don't want to sound like I'm disparaging Jill here or anybody else who kindly just was really excited about a real oh, draft. Because draft. drafts are fucking cool. They're yeah. like so. And it is a funny turn of little events, aliens, right? Or, or they're like little aliens, right? Or big ones, I big should ones, say. They're yeah. very strange creatures. Long necks. Long tongues. Long necks. Long have you ever seen? Have you ever seen them fight with their necks? Shit, scary. Yeah, they wrap it around multiple times. So like they I can choke you with their neck. Right. It's kind of weird. I totally get the enthusiasm. Like, oh, no, that was a real draft. Like, yeah, that's super cool. We love Nobu. But I still think we're justified Nabo. in pointing out poor CGI in a scene that's like 90% CGI. Yes. If you look at that picture, a lot of people send as evidence. It is 90% uh, blue in that photo. Yeah, it's kind of that funny. Like, where all the CGI it's goes. real. And it's like, <laughs> what about all that blue shit? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it is a neat factoid. On to my question, Jill says, maybe I just missed something, but we all know if Ellie would have been given the choice that staying at the hospital or going with Joel, she would have stayed. But how do we know that she wasn't given the choice? We see her go unconscious, uh, excuse me, unconscious. And then the next time we see her awake is in the car and she immediately asks what happened with the fireflies and where Marlene was. How would she know they found the fireflies or that Marlene was there without talking to them? Do you think she woke up between the smoke bomb and surgery and talked to Marlene again? Maybe I missed something or totally misunderstood it. Just wanted your thoughts. And I will say, uh, I should have said this at the beginning. We're going to talk about the m essential moral question of Joel versus the fireflies. There's probably four or five emails that I chose and they're not in order, but it is 
the most talked about thing about the show. It's been mm-hmm. talked about since 2013 and in, in subreddits uh, ad nauseum. Yeah. Um, and it's funny to them that it's being brought up now that's the show. But it, I read Jill's because I think it, there's some clarity on that scene that I wanted to talk about. So is this the only one we're going with on this? No, that's what I'm warning the oh, listeners okay. that there's multiple of these. Okay. But they each have a different kind of thing I wanted to aspect of it I wanted to uh, touch okay, on. Okay, I see. I see. So with Jill, I would say we don't all know that if Ellie would have been given the choice uh, about staying at the hospital or going with Joel, she would have stayed because there are lots of people that you're about to read some of them that think Ellie would hundred percent not agree to do that. If yeah. it meant her death, that's one thing people say a lot. I agree with you, Jill, that I think that that is spoken aloud just by her previous actions. That's something we know yeah. about the character of Ellie is that she would gladly sacrifice herself for other people. Um, however, what I wanted to touch on is in the game, the way that this plays out is slightly but very significantly different Yeah. in the sense that Ellie almost drowns, so she's unconscious when she gets brought to the fireflies. Yeah, she's never, never wakes aware up. that she was there. She never even knew she saw the fireflies until right. she wakes up with Joel in the car. Show Ellie was captured conscious, actually, in the smoke bomb, right? Oh, what's up, Marlene? You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey. So they actually had to tell her something and then put her to sleep. Like, hey, we're going to do some surgery. Um so, yeah, I just wanted to point that's all I wanted to point out with this email, because uh, mm-hmm. I think that's important. You know what I mean? I think that's fair. Were we I know last week we discussed maybe having a section towards the latter half of this episode of like going into part two game spoilers. I think that would have been better if Jimmy was here because I've only played a third of part two. Oh, OK. Um, and I know other podcasts have spent like 10 minutes at the end speculating what season two might include. OK. But I don't know with our listeners if we'll get a lot of value from that. Um be just simply because I've only played a third of the second one. Oh, I've played the second one three times. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. You guys can go hammer time on that. I but. mean, well, there's something with this specific question that is, you know, a big part of the second game. Yeah. That I could speak to, but I don't know if I should. I don't think so. Okay. I think a lot of our listeners are not gamers. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I mean, we can maybe touch on it at the end. Okay. Um, just get a little verbal bumper. Maybe bring Satan. But, but I agree with them. I agree with you and uh this is still Jill's email, right? It is. I agree with you and Jill that like that we can infer Ellie's choice would have been to do that based off because they really make a big point even in the show about like her like, we're seeing this through. No matter what, I have to see this through because it all has to be worth something. And I mean, yes, someone could argue like, yeah, but she's a kid. Does she really understand the choice he's making? Sure. And that's why I think that the final scene is such a good, you know, moral quandary that is great for debating. It is. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's ripe. This next email comes in from Jen. Hey, guys. Love the pod. Hello, Jen. Terrible old Tony impersonate impressions and all. What? Pardon me. (laughs) You have opened the Pandora's, bo- the Tony's box. Mm. You can't just, <laughs> you can't just speak my name into the void like, and not make, expect me to appear. It's like Candyman. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, Tony, Tony. Wait, that's a band. <laughs> I know the finale is a bit divisive. We were just talking about that. As it relates to Joel exterminating an entire cell of fireflies to quote unquote save Ellie. But I found what he did to be totally understandable. In many ways, the worst thing Ellie and Joel have faced are people not infected from the soldier who killed Sarah to the fascist Fedra soldiers in the QZ to Kathleen and her crew to sexual predator David. These have been the biggest threats to Ellie and to Joel north of clickers. Joel understands the nature of people in this post-apocalyptic world. And when he compares potentially saving humanity, something that's not even guaranteed should Ellie's brain be harvested with his love for Ellie, it's not even close. He makes the calculation that humanity is not worth saving. Ellie is as someone who also hates humans. I get it. (laughs) Team Joel. (laughs) Keep up the good work guys. Jen. Um, I agree. And the only thing I would add here, and again, there's another, there is at least one or two emails uh, that are like vehemently, Against the fireflies, as most people mm-hmm. online are. Like, I got so many comments. That's um, so fascinating. In my TikTok video. It's fat. The difference between the game and the show audiences is really fascinating because I remember when the game came out, people were like, Joel's the villain of the show. Like, how, what a great, or this game, what a great turn of events that the protagonist ends up being the villain of the whole franchise. Yeah, I called Andy and I said, oh my God, Joel's the villain. That's yeah. crazy. But when, but in the series it ended, so many people were like, oh, yeah, Joel, I get it. Yeah, that dude, you know, and I, and I wonder 
why exactly that is, I think the game does do a better job of of kind of. It's Pedro Pascal instead of a digital. Yeah, people like, people love, love Pedro Pascal, and I think the game does kind of paint a better brush of like what he's doing is wrong. Um, because because I think the game even makes a bigger point of like Ellie would choose this were she not unconscious. Yes, the fact that she is unconscious and can't choose this is problematic. You kind of want to like, but also. I think that the whole idea that there is a right or wrong answer is completely against what the game is actually saying. Yeah, that's true as well. The point that it's worth the conversation is the point, which Mm -hmm. seems pointless, but uh, both sides are right. Both sides are wrong. It's the Mm -hmm. trolley problem, the classic philosophical problem. Should I kill five to save one? Is that morally wrong? Am I a murderer now? Because I actually chose an action here, blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. It's the reverse trolley problem. Should I kill 20 to save one? Uh, it's it's the whole like the me- needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few versus like, does that mean you lose your humanity by doing that? And a, a lot of people, and I said this on the air the first time I said this in the TikTok video, people just reiterated this point back at me. It's very frustrating, but I'm gonna try to calmly say um, whether or not you believe that the fireflies uh, can can make a vaccine from this, whether or not you think a fungal vaccine is scientifically possible, whether or not you think they should have run more tests on Ellie and extracted her blood rather than jumping straight to extracting the, the fungus from her brain and killing her. It makes no sense to you, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so many people are suddenly experts in how vaccines are created and distributed because they read a subreddit from 2013. I think that's fascinating. However, I mean, that's true for the plague we lived through recently. <laughs> very, very true. However, that is not the point of this game or this show or this story. Uh, you're the willing suspension of disbelief. All you need to know is that the fireflies do believe they have a cure from this that they can make. Yeah, they do believe it will help and that they can distribute it. And Joel also believes that. How do I know this? Neil Druckmann has said so. He has said the fireflies do believe they're good people. They do believe they can make a cure. Right. Mm-hmm. That is not the fundamental issue you should be questioning here. So many people get in the weeds of like, well, I've done a six extensive research and there's no way they could even make a vaccine from that. So therefore, Joel was right because they were just going to kill her for no reason. No, you're making it too easy on yourself to pick a side. That's the, that defeats the point of the story. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It reminds me of the people who are watching a sci fi movie and they go, did you oh. A liquid wouldn't stay in that solidification that long in that kind of gravity. You know, it's like you can't even hear explosions in space. Exactly. Uh, That's like, okay, well, (laughs) you know what I mean? (laughs) You're you're defeating the message. Yes. Um, We can get super pedantic on points like that all day. And I don't I don't want to shit on anybody for that. I just again, I'm a little bit frustrated because I've read this argument hundreds of times in the past week. But I do think you're uh, selling yourself short on a really interesting experience here. Um, because you are somewhat supposed to identify with Joel. Yeah. I do as well. Yeah. If that's my, the beauty of if it. my daughter or my son were on that table and I had any kind of skill set that Joel has, I guarantee you I'd be sitting in the car with my son or my daughter right now. Yeah. Right. But what's interesting about this thought experiment is also thinking that's maybe not the right thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think what you need to understand about Joel's character, in my opinion, is this is a very selfish act for him. He's not doing this to save Ellie. He's doing this because he can't bear to lose Ellie and he doesn't care if the world gets fucked. That's what's so interesting about this character choice. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, (laughs) saving Ellie is an added benefit, of course, but you're right. He's not doing it for her. He's doing it for him. Yes. And that's... That's the beauty of the ending, I think. Yeah, it is beautiful because we've already we do sympathize with Joel. We watched him lose yeah. his daughter. We don't want to see that again. This is one of those things where like we, we've said it a hundred times, I feel like at this point. But like one. Here we go. Like what he's doing is he's condemning the humanity possibly from ever getting better. Like he's doing us to like a slow extinction. Right. And but we are we don't necessarily think He's bad for doing it. You understand why he's yes. doing it. You might even do it yourself if you had that situation. Like you said, you would probably yeah. be in the same shoes. But that doesn't take away from the fact that he's still robbing humanity from a hope for a vaccine. And he's probably killing the only people who could possibly make that happen. We don't know if there are any other doctors uh, in Fedra or any other Firefly cells. As far as we know, these are the only people left that could even have a chance at creating this and he kills them all. And there you go. Like, and, and and again, like I said, you don't 
condemn him for that act because it's a very understandable one. And you don't condemn the Fireflies and Marlene for wanting to do this to Ellie either because from that, from that perspective, they are literally saving millions of people. They're saving the human race. And you understand both sides of the argument. And it goes back to the great philosophical uh, debate, like who is right? Who is wrong? Yeah. There's no answer to the trolley problem. It's called the trolley problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so any, anyway, again, there might be a few other emails basically surrounding that same kind of central question. Um, and and hopefully I don't yada, yada, yada them. But that is the biggest argument about this. That's what makes the story so special. Right. Um, the fact that that is a constant debate. This next email comes in from Matthew A. Hey, guys, my name is Matt A. From <laughs> <laughs> Pearson, Hello, Matt. From Pearson, Georgia. And I've been a listener since Stranger Things season four and have been oh, hooked yeah. ever since. Your humor and just all around friendship is right up my alley. Oh. The Last of Us is my favorite game franchise. So I was ecstatic when you guys decided to cover it. And Jimmy was a good addition. Also, shout out to Madison, neither of whom are here. Uh, I may have a bit of a crush on her laughing emoji. Anyways, to my question. (laughs) What are some things? Madison wasn't here. She didn't hear that. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) What are some things that you guys are most looking forward to in the second part of The Last of Us? I realize this question will only get answered if you decide to talk about season two and beyond. But I wanted to ask just in case any who's will thank you guys for all you do. Streaming things is always a highlight of my week. I read this, Steve, at this juncture. Uh, I was hoping we could get into some kind of non-spoilery generic things about what what we might be looking forward to in season two. Well, I think the biggest thing for people to look forward to in season two is just that the fact that what Joel does at the end of this season, there are consequences to that, what he does. And the way those consequences come up in part two are very thrilling. um, And I'm excited for people to, see what happens in the story. What happens next? My fervent wish is that the second game is every bit is from what I've seen. So again, I've only played 10 hours of a 25 hour game, um, but I want them to fully commit. I don't want them to fall prey to the negative reaction of trolls over the past five years or whatever, because they have the opportunity now yeah. to kind of change things and rewin them over. Fuck. Don't, them. don't <laughs> seriously. If, Oh my God, this is a The Last Jedi Rise of Skywalker problem. Do not appease those specific trolls because the people who are very outspoken about why part two of The Last of Us isn't good do not understand the moral of the story. For the most part. <laughs> For yes. the most part. There are people who honestly have like, I think, oh, I think the second game is a little, has some pacing issues. That's all completely fine. Well, I, but like, to one real quick, Dave Chen sent me an article. Cause I was like, why don't you like the second game? Dave Chen of slash Filmcast? Yes. Uh, name drop. Well, I didn't mean to do that. I was just trying to say like, <laughs> there are people that I highly respect that don't like the second game mm-hmm. is all I was trying to say. Like, um, and so I was really confused because all I'd ever run into is like misogynists and stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I was really curious, like, what don't you like about the, the second game? You're very intelligent. Um, so he sent me an article and, to paraphrase, because it's very long, very like, I mean, it's like a college essay. It's a thesis, you know, um, but essentially like the first game is a lot about love. Um, and I think a lot of people think the second game goes to a, goes to a very regressive, dark place with these characters in this story. Well, it's like, well, what do we go through all that for then? Uh, kind of thing. And it was like, it was a really legitimate argument. Um, sure. But other than that, there's a lot of like derp, 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 that don't like this. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the crowd that I think the majority of people who dislike that game the or the vocal majority who dislike the second game are the of the misogyny type neck beard people who are just like, oh, girls, you know? Sure. And they lionize certain people in the franchise. That's like, that's not what you're supposed to be doing. Um, yeah. Not in the way you're doing it. And it, it's it's. It's weird. And you're right. I think the first, I think Dave Chen does bring up a good point where the first game is about love. Uh, but it's also about, it's, it's always about the main theme of both games are what are, what are you willing to do for the people that you love? So in the first game in season one of last of us, Joel is willing to end humanity for the, for the girl he loves. Right. Uh, and also for himself. And and, and, the, and the second game has a very similar thing, but it, they do it in almost like a backwards way mm-hmm. and they do it in very interesting and surprising ways. And, and it reminds you why humanity is so beautiful, but it is a darker, 
harsher game than the first one. I think the story of, of I know people two, listening right now that are like, what? I can't yeah, take it, anymore. <laughs> part, part two is darker. It's very harsh. It's, it's cruel in some ways, but again, and this is the thing that makes this, this franchise so beautiful. It also is mo the most human and endearing. And there are moments that are just yeah. like, this is what humanity could. It's the opposite coin of what humanity is. There is this like the absolute cruelty of humanity, but the absolute love. And what do you do to protect the people that you do love? Are do you become cruel? It's stuff like that. And I, I still, to this day, I think the ending of part two may be the most I've ever cried and felt hollow in my life. Yes. <laughs> and I can't talk about why, but there's a. I, I, oh man, I'm so excited for what they do. But yeah, if they. Strip away. Neil Druckmann any dropped that. a season two poster teaser today. I saw it. Um, which is, I'm just telling the listeners, look on that for, for on Instagram or Twitter if you follow Neil Druckmann. But uh, they've also said, said for sure that season two will be more than one season. We don't know how many. Mm -hmm. We suspect two, uh, two seasons because Craig Mason's not a, a, like a bunch of seasons guy. He's already said that. So mm -hmm. I expect season two to be two seasons long. And uh, you and Jimmy have both said there's a really perfect spot in the part two game for it to break off as a season ender. Right. Yeah. I, I could see where they could make that a season ender if they wanted to do that. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, but yeah, thank really you. Excited Steve. about it. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot. I know. Um, I'm going to read most of this email. This one's actually really funny. I wonder how quick I can get there. It's a long one. This one comes in, uh, from longtime listener, Andy, uh, from Liverpool. I'm going to do the whole thing in a Hi, Liverpool Andy. accent. The the poo. Hi guys. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to drop an email. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Just wanted to drop an email about the show as I had a few thoughts. First off, big fan of the show. Love listening to you guys every week. Special shout out to Jimmy, who's not here, but who's done a good job of stepping into Andy's shoes. Who who's not is Jimmy. <laughs> He's been a great addition to the pod. I haven't played the game, uh, so but I watched the show purely as a newcomer. I have to say, as someone who's never played the game, I loved every minute of it. Sure, oh, there were some episodes that which were longer, particularly the last one. But overall, it's been a home run. Same. I know a big criticism people had about the show was the lack of monsters, but I never felt that that was a negative. As a huge Stephen King fan, I always liked the idea that no matter how big and scary the creatures are, the real monsters are always the people. The show captured this perfectly. One thing that did surprise me, however, was how people think that Joel is the bad guy. Now, hear me out. The bad guy. My back is too broken to be doing any kind of gymnastics to reach that conclusion. So I'll try to keep it simple. <laughs> Joel is her dad in almost every way one can be. As a parent, you're willing to do whatever it takes to protect your child, regardless of the consequences it has on yourself. Mm -hmm. A great parallel was drawn at the start and end of the final episode that perfectly demonstrated that Ellie's mom was willing. Or I'm sorry, English. Ellie's mom was willing to take her own life after she was infected in order to save her. When Tess arrived, she then made a decision as a mother and lied to her about when she cut the cord in order to keep her alive. Te I'm sorry, te he meant to say, um, not Tess, but uh, Marlene. Marlene. And he actually corrects that in the second email. I meant to do that. Marlene would have undoubtedly killed Ellie if she had thought she was infected. Fast forward to a present time and Joel was forced to make a decision as a father. Mm -hmm. I don't think he ever thought that they would have to kill her to find a cure because as a viewer, I never thought that either. I thought like Ellie did that the secret was her blood. They all thought that to pause, nobody knew she was going to have to die for this. Right. Just a lot of people believe Ellie would have still done it. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, well, she's not old enough to make that decision. That's fair. But like yeah, those legalities fair. don't apply in this apocalyptic world. Right. Like, of right. course, like, oh, you have to get a guardian and a lawyer. No. <laughs> No, you wouldn't. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. And we know Joel's not signing off on it. Definitely not. She's not going on that. She's not doing that. She's not going on that field trip. <laughs> She's not going on that field trip. <laughs> Back to Andy's email. <laughs> when he made the decision to lie to her to keep her alive, he was mir mirroring mm. what her mother had done all those years earlier. I like that. I like that too, Andy. This, I feel, was also deliberate as it demonstrates yeah. that he was acting as much as a parent as her real mother was, right? Um, and he goes on a child is your life, your world, your everything as a father of three boys. I know this is clear as I know the sky is blue. The show and clearly the game demonstrated this by how Joel became after Sarah died. The world as he knew it ended. It took finding another daughter 20 years later to change that for him. If Joel had gotten Ellie to the fireflies a lot earlier, then perhaps his decision would have been different. But instead, he made the decision that every parent would in that situation. He protected his own world, his daughter. Absolutely. Annie Hussel, thanks for taking the time to read these ramblings. And I look forward to what new shows you have lined up in the future. In the words of that famous wordsmith, Jerry Springer, take care of yourselves and each other. Ooh, Andy from Liverpool. You don't, you don't often get a Jerry Springer quote. Andy, turn it off if your kids are in the car or the room. 
Andy goes on. P.S. <laughs> Andy, Andy, turn it off. P.S. Last time I sent an email about Stranger Things, you read it. You read it out loud, but made jokes about cum in it. So I was unable to let my boys hear it. <laughs> <laughs> If you do read it, then try to keep the vulgarity to a minimum, please. PPS, don't read out the PS as it will contain the word come if you read it out. <laughs> you betrayed his trust. <laughs> he asked you one thing to do. I told him to get the kids paused because I think that's fucking hilarious. <laughs> I couldn't, he couldn't trust me after writing comedy gold. PPPS, best not to read out the email. <laughs> <laughs> now oh my god i'm sorry andy <laughs> now hold on let me walk you back through this how okay. it occurred in my mind okay let's hear it play andy, by play. andy from liverpool p.s last time i sent an email about stranger things you read it out loud but made jokes about come in it it's way funnier in an english accent and we all agreed on that yeah we can agree <laughs> andy we love you i know you're a longtime friend of the pod that was a very long, heartfelt, thoughtful email. Bring the kids um, back. I think we're done. And I loved it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, bring them back. Well, we can't guarantee that for the rest of the show here. Oh, that's true. But he, <laughs> but he probably wants them to be like, look, look kids, the, the men on the radio are reading daddy's email. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the men with the faces for radio. I like your funny words, magic man. All right, moving on. Our next email comes in from Zali M. Hi, streaming things. I'm writing to you from Australia. I wonder what the apocalypse would look like here. I'm not a gamer, so I'd never even heard of The Last of Us until one of my friends told me Pedro Pascal was doing a zombie apocalypse show. I decided to watch it when I heard you guys would be covering it, and I'm so glad I did. I had no context for it whatsoever, and all I knew was zombies. So I went in completely <laughs> blind and came out absolutely <laughs> loving it. I definitely look forward to the 12.30 p.m. on Mondays, which is when the episodes were released here. Damn! P.m. Well, that's true. Noon on Mondays. It's Australia. Yeah. How much crying I would be doing on my couch. In that train of thought, I thought I would share the top five things that made me cry in chronological order. One, Bill and Frank's episode. Two, mm. Sam's death. Yes. Three, Ellie and Riley after they get bit. Yeah. Four, Annie giving birth to Ellie. Five, the giraffes. Five great cry moments. Great Amazing. cry moments. I love how you threw in a happy cry in there, too. Yes. The, with the draft. Yeah. <laughs> Not with like anything else. Sorry for the long email. They get way longer than that. And thank you for the coverage of the show. I started listening because of Stranger Things and I'm glad I stayed for The Last of Us. Uh, I, I mainly read that because he said, I wonder what the apocalypse would look apocalypse would look like in Australia. You ever seen Mad Max, you ever my seen friend? Mad Max? <laughs> <laughs> we well, know exactly what it would look like. But what about a fungal apocalypse? Wouldn't no. Mad Max would not look like a fungal. That's not an apocalypse. This, this is, is an, an apocalypse. apocalypse. That was kind. Tasmanian devil. <laughs> what, what are... <laughs> Tasmanian devil? What are some of your top cry moments? Do you remember? I thought we'd do a fun thing where we would also... Dude, he picked them all. Those are the ones. And this, those are good ones, yeah. Yeah, those are all the big cry cries. Oh, uh, man. <sighs> You remember me. When, when did you look? You looked over and I was crying. You were crying at one point. What I mean, I'm crying that? a lot all yeah. the time as soon as you saw me. But I caught you again. Usually I don't catch you. You busted me. I busted you again. <laughs> I busted you again. He, got, he treats it like I'm doing something dirty. He's like, hey, <laughs> hey, throws me tissues. Knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> no crying in this house. There's no crying in baseball. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Those are all the good ones. I think for me, the one that got me most is probably probably Sam's death. That's tough. Yeah. Sam's death is tough, but I was, um, I was fucked up by Anna, like just seeing Ashley Johnson. Yeah. Hearing that voice, um, giving birth to another Ellie and like the amount of sacrifice. And they used that like a real baby. And like, it was just like, it was a lot for me, man. I just, my daughter well, was Well, it was the born. baby from the head up that was blue mostly <laughs> everywhere else. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Baby's name was Nabo. Nabo. <laughs> Our next email comes in from Rosemary B. Hi, guys. Big fan of you guys discovering the pod during Stranger Things season four. Keep up the great work. Oh, real quick. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to add on to the Anna's birth scene. Oh, okay. Real quick. Uh, so a friend of mine who also listens to the show texted me after this episode. And I'm not going to say her name just because I don't know if she realized I was going to do this. But, uh, but she wrote to me, random commentary. Having just birthed another human two weeks ago, congratulations. <laughs> I have no fucking clue how Ellie's mom was able to run or even climb stairs while being that close to delivery. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> She's very strong. I can't. Neither of us can speak to that, Steve. Right. No, I know. <laughs> but, but she did bring up a good point after that, which I thought was I'm interesting. I'm pretty sure I could do it. 
<laughs> I'm pretty sure I could. <laughs> Just got to bear down. <laughs> uh, but she she continued, and it didn't look like she was actually staying there. It was totally empty. D- were th- so? Do you think the fireflies were that was their base of operations? And if not, how did they find her? Because she does kind of bring up a good point. It was like a very empty space. Wait, 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 why was she staying there? Yeah, like like. Do you think the place she went, she ended up in that farmhouse? Uh-huh. Do you think that was like where they were staying locally? No, I think she was supposed to meet Marlene there for maybe supplies or medicine for the baby, or maybe mm-hmm. she knew she was going into labor and she wanted Marlene to help. Right. Um, and that's, that's how I Marlene she found wanted, them. I think she was wanting to her. smuggle the baby out so they wouldn't go, the probably wouldn't go into Fedra, which is fucked up of Marlene to just drop it off at Fedra. Right. Um, but yeah, I think I got the impression they met there often and Marlene was late, which okay. is why she ended up getting fucked by the the runner, like chased by the runner and stuff. Yeah. Um, because Marlene's kind of apologetic. Remember, like, I'm sorry, I'm here now. Mm-hmm. Ooh, your leg looks a little pussy. You know? Ooh. <laughs> so not good. That's the way I read that scene. Um, and this is apparently somebody emails us about it. We'll read that soon. But I know that this is canon. Like uh, you know, Neil has talked about this. Uh, it's in one of the notes, I think, that, like Easter egg things that you can find in the game as you're playing, like a, a note from Anna um, that like, implies that she's been bitten. And the person that emails does a really good job of explaining why. Are we going to get to that email? We will. Okay, cool. But Rosemary says, uh, a random question might have been asked before. In the Last of Us universe, did the cordyceps spread to other mammals? Has there anything ever been said about the outbreak affecting animal populations? Steve? Uh, Yes, there is a hint that this does happen. It's not widely visible in in the game. Like as you're playing it, you don't come across like infected dogs or anything like that. But the the scene when they go to the the, the college and they find the monkeys. Oh, uh, yeah. You, you remember that in the show? You, they find the little monkeys and yes. it's a big thing. Well, in the game, you can like kind of like read what they were actually doing with the monkeys there. They were trying to find a cure and they were using the monkeys as test lab monkeys, essentially. And one of the doctors that was in charge of it was like, you know, he was taught, you can like find like recordings where he's talking like day one, the the test results didn't go very well. And then you kind of follow that guy's story during, while you're playing the level. I failed today's wordle. Well, he, he he's so like, <laughs> he's like, uh, he's mad because the fireflies are like, this research isn't going anywhere. We're packing up everything and we're moving West to Utah where yeah. they end up. And he's like, what a waste. Well, we could have found something, but I guess it's no harm in keeping these monkeys. And he go and he releases them. And then one of the monkeys bites him while, while it's being free. He's like, Oh no, I'm infected now essentially. So like, even though these monkeys don't, I guess they don't get all fungal. They can still pass the fungus, the cordyceps through their own bites. And that guy ends up, shooting himself and you can find his body in his last testament and it's kind of a funny moment in the game where it's like this is the last will and testament of dr so-and-so and joel's like jesus christ and like fast forwards it yeah <laughs> to like when he tells that's him when like he's in the, like the pipe right is it what the i what? think he's in like a pipe when he finds that last tape and he uh like he's crawling through some a duct work or something oh no you're with his body when you find the last tape there's one which is like in a, a an office building because then after they hear where they've gone that's when you see uh uh, David's men break into the hospital. Yeah. Crazy shit though. But yeah, I forgot about the monkeys. Like mm-hmm. that's verified because yeah, it's verified that they had the, the cordyceps. Them damn cordyceps. Damn, damn cordyceps. He's keeping everybody mean. This next email comes in from Tammy W. Hello guys. Hi Tammy. Wanted to write in and give this opinion of the finale. Everyone is talking about the moral dilemma. Joel decided when he killed everyone to save Ellie. See what I'm saying? I knew there'd be a lot of these. <laughs> Instead of letting her be used to save the world from the pandemic. I disagree that there's any such moral dilemma, at least in the way the show presented the characters and the information. I'm a show watcher only. Number one, I do not think we have any information to say that Ellie was willing to die to save the world. I disagree a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. And she was not given that choice for us to know uh, what she would have chosen. So podcasters, I listened to about three of (laughs) y'all keep assuming that Ellie would have been agreed to uh, would have agreed to die to save the world based on what Joel Based on when Joel offered to turn back and she said, we finished this, but I don't think that was enough to say she wanted to die. Instead, I believe she wanted to get to the fireflies to see what they would do to use her to save the world, not ever thinking it would mean her death. And apparently Marlene believed that Ellie would have declined as she did not ask her and lied to her instead. Now, a couple things. I think you're 100 percent correct that Ellie never considered the fact that she might die necessarily. Mm-hmm. I do think there's a lot of evidence in the actions and the way that she presents herself 
um, to suggest that she would decide to sacrifice herself. You can see the way that she, um, how much effort she puts into saving Joel when he's been stabbed by the baseball bat. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole thing that she endures with David is just simply because she refused to leave Joel to die. Right. Um, that's just one person. And she talks frequently uh, you know, she's always sees the best in people, how quickly she reacts to, to Sam and Henry. And she, she curtails Joel's murderous tendencies frequently throughout the show. Um, she, she has a great uh, amount of faith in humanity. Um, but I agree with you that she doesn't know about it. Uh, but I also don't think Marlene believed Ellie would decline. And that's why she didn't tell Ellie. I think she's honest in what she tells Joel that she didn't tell Ellie mostly because she didn't want Ellie to know she was going to die. Like it's easier this way. She thinks she's going to sleep. Don't mm-hmm. worry. She's not stressing or anything. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Right. Like um, I do think that that was her intent. That's interesting because I, I agree with you, Chris, for slightly different reasons, the same, but also slightly different reasons. Um, I think that another reason why you can say that it's, uh, to me, they they lay the groundwork for Ellie would make this choice if she had been given it is because it goes back to like her incident with Riley. They both get bitten. Her best friend dies and uh, she doesn't know why. So she has this purpose. Like there's a reason why I survived yeah. this. I have a purpose. I have a reason for being alive and not have died with my friend. And if she was given the choice, like, oh, your purpose is to save mankind not only all the points you brought out about how she actually cares about a lot of people and she was trying to save a lot of people, but that is her fulfilling her purpose. Yeah. And I think she would do that. And uh, on the, on the same coin with Marlene, I think Marlene doesn't tell her, I kind of like what you said, like, you know, she, she cares about Ellie in a way where she doesn't want that to come across. But I also think cynically Marlene doesn't even want to take the chance that this person would say no because she thinks well, that's kind of what 100 important. That's that kind they of what get Tammy's that. saying too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I do disagree that there is nothing um, in the show or in the first game that would specify that Ellie would make this choice if she were given now. And that's the problem with the Fireflies at the end; they don't actually allow her to make that choice, or at least we don't see that in the show. Um, and that is the problem. But I think people aren't really kind of picking up on some of the things that this character is saying and doing leading up to this moment. Yes. Um, she goes on to say, number two, Joel did not choose between saving one little girl in the whole world because we don't have information to know that what the doctor had planned for Ellie was a surefire way, way to create a vaccine. We touched on this earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, at, at best, Ellie was being killed on a gamble. That's not a moral dilemma. Again, I think the point of the story is to assume that all of those people involved fully believe that they can make a cure at least. Right. Yeah. Um, number three, the research should have continued with Ellie to determine if there was a way to use her to cure the population without murdering her. Again, if the story would have been effective on a nine month timeline, I think Neil Druckmann would have done this, but I think you're supposed to be, you're supposed to yada, 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 the necessary blood tests and studying that they do. Right. Right. You're you're supposed to take the neurosurgeon at value. I've seen people make TikToks talking about, well, the the world ended in 2000 or 2013 in the game or whatever, 2003 in the show. Uh, So neurosurgery technology in 2003 is the best this guy would have. He looks to be about 46 years old. That means he was 25 when the world ended. He wouldn't even have gone through residency yet. And I'm like. Jesus fucking Christ, guys, <laughs> this you're just ruining your, the story for yourself. You're going like, down the rabbit hole a little bit too much. Yeah, I think to take excuse me. I'm not saying anything to you, Tammy. I yeah, think, yeah, I no, agree no. with uh, I, I agree with you. I would save my kid. But I yes. do think to take the moral dilemma out of this story is to simplify it. To George Romero zombie show Walking Dead later seasons <laughs> kind of way. Right. And I don't think that's the intention of this particular story. I think it's supposed to make you think like, huh, what would um, I do? Yeah. Even if, even if you had to, you know, choose between your kid and a surefire way to a hundred years from now, restart the human race, because this would take a while to even affect anything, you know, yeah, a few extra immune people is all it would do initially. Uh, would you do that? Knowing that in your lifetime, you would never see any benefit. You would only see what you traded. You would only see the loss. You're planting a seeds to a tree you'll never see. And if you wouldn't, are you brave enough to admit that that means you're a selfish person? Oh, oh, that's tough, right? (laughs) That's what the story is asking you to do. Um, So anyway, I think that that's fascinating. Some people do not. And that's fair. Yeah. Um, 
we got a quite a few more. Let me try to get going. I'll read as many as we can. I know we're running late. Keep doing it. I, I, this is fun. The next email comes in from Abby. That might be a triggering name for game fans. Hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy and Steve. <laughs> My name is Abby, doing it again, and I'm writing in from Indianapolis. I found your show during the great boom of ST4 and have been here ever since. I love listening to you guys and sh shoot the shit about things you're watching and even finally started Yellow Jackets so I could keep up with you. So Aww. thank you for getting me into that masterpiece. Awesome. I'm glad you like it. Oh, yeah. That's good. Side note, I grew up in Union, Kentucky and love catching the occasional Florence y'all I reference. lived in Union, Kentucky. You did. I was there. Yeah. That's where we... Uh, that's season what we filmed three season Stranger three. Things. Yeah. yeah. Stranger Things season three. That's in there. Union. Annie Hoosel. That's what that's her words again. I've been excited about the <laughs> last of us. You have to keep pointing that out. Yeah. I think people are just like, you can't just put that in people's emails, guy. Uh, no, they write it. Um, I've been excited about the last of us adaptation and it did not disappoint. Bella Ramsey blew me away this yeah. season. And Pedro Pascal was incredible as Joel. Mm -hmm. I laughed when I saw that they filmed the last episode with a real giraffe. One just like you, I thought it was bad CGI. I was wondering if there was a moment for each of you when you felt most personally connected to a character. For me, it was when Ellie finally burst out and told Riley to stay there and then kissed her. Um, I am a lesbian and I just felt that at that moment in my gut and cried. The fear and then the relief was so real and I felt like a teenager again in that moment. There's so much more I could say, but this is already a novel. Thank you so much for the great content and I always have a good time. Bear down, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Bear down. Steve, is there any particular moment where you felt most personally connected to a character? Oh, man, this is hard. Uh, just coming out of the blue like this. I'm trying to like think of all like the past moments. And scanning the, moments. Scanning moments. Oh, cannot find them. <laughs> Searching for moments. Error, error. Um, <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, connecting. Oh, you know, I, maybe I talked about this. I don't... I, this isn't so much like a I connected with this character, but it to me it's the most meaningful interaction in the game, and that's the very final scene where Ellie's like she lays it all out on the table for Joel, like, "Hey, um, you know, I my friend died, then Tess died, and all that had to mean for stand for something did, is what you told me about the fireflies true." And Joel's trying to protect her, but also like he doesn't want to like. Tell her the truth. I killed a lot of people to be able to hang out with you. Yeah. I, I really want to teach you how to play guitar. <laughs> uh, uh, he he doesn't want to risk that relationship and being honest yes. with her. And just the way she kind of looks at him and she doesn't really believe him, but she has, she has no reason to distrust him really, but she doesn't believe him. And just that like, okay, like that, just the yeah. resignation to trusting this person you don't believe is heartbreaking to me. And the delivery in both the game and the show is just so impactful. And I love that moment. And um, I don't know if I personally like see myself in that because I guess maybe I do because we've all kind of been there with people where, you know, they're lying to you and you wish they wouldn't be. You're like, God, I, I really wish you weren't lying to me. I feel like you are, but I have no choice but to trust you and go with it. Because if I don't, that might upend my view of the world or my standing. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's that. Yeah. I love Ashley Johnson, the way she talks about that when she talks about, uh, she's spoken about it personally. And she's like, when I, when I watched that moment, uh, she said, uh, you know, you know that Ellie knows that he's lying mm -hmm. and that their relationship will never be the same. And she's really sad about that, but also yeah. what can she do about it? And I'm going to cry. Talking about, like the way she describes it, it was yeah. like, oh, you know, uh, and, you, and you get that. <laughs> Yeah. You get that in the performances and it's, it's just such a simple concept, but it's, ah, oh, it's played masterfully. Mm -hmm. I think for me, and this might sound strange, but it's, <laughs> it's Anna giving birth to Ellie, which of course <laughs> I didn't give birth to my children, but I did hold them straight out of Compton. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> straight out of Compton. I, uh, <laughs> And it, there's, it's, that's a life changing moment each time where you're like, holy fuck, little human made life, me in trouble. I feel like a 10 year old in my brain. So how am I going to take care of somebody? Um, all that in like, you know, a million other thoughts in about 0.8 seconds run through your brain. And when you look at that little human being, like I was just looking at my daughter today, she crawled for the first time today. Aww. And it's like 
the, I can't describe how much I'd love you. I can't, I, I can't, you know what I mean? Like, holy shit. I hope nothing bad ever happens to you. I hope you've experienced zero pain. I hope the world just falls at your feet and, and you know, that's not true. And you're like, oh, I am upset in advance at the pain you will surely experience. Right. Ah, oh. <laughs> you know, all of that goes through Brian every time you look at him. Right. And you can see that in Ashley Johnson's performance as Anna, when she looks at that baby, she's already found out she's going to die. She's already been bitten. You know what I mean? And still, she started just fought a, a, like a fucking zombie would stabbed it with a knife. <laughs> and then the baby popped out while she was doing that. And still she picks it up and just smiles like, oh, my God, like it's it still baby. hits her. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's that moment. I think that that resonates the most with me. So thank you. Great question, Abby. Wonderful question. Our next email comes in from Kimberly M. It's me again. Hi, Kimberly. I just watched the last of a season finale and wanted to share some thoughts and funnies. I think that in Ellie's mind, the reason she is so quiet all the way through that episode is not just the trauma, but that she had to take a life, uh, but that she had to take a life in the moment. She was all about the stabby stabs, but later it hit her (laughs) that she had killed someone, even if it was a horrible person. So in her mind, saving everyone was what she wanted to do to redeem herself. That was taken away from her by the circumstances Joel was describing, but she was not buying it. Of course, that's what we we're just talking about. Yeah. And I think that taking your life is, is, is part of the trauma, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but anyway, we've watched this whole series with my son who's 25 and played the games all the way through. So he was saying when they are fixing to do some killing, oh, they're about to have a Joel problem. Uh, or that guy has a real bad <laughs> Ellie problem. It just makes me laugh. We're about to have a Joel problem. <laughs> it just makes me laugh because he gets so excited when it syncs up with the game for the parts he likes. He keeps foreshadowing how the second game sucks, but I hope they diverge from the parts that do suck. Again, we've already talked about that. Yeah, second game does not suck. No hate to your, <laughs> your no hate to your son. Um, Sp- hot take. I'm one of the few people who think the second game is better than the first game. That is very few people. It is very few people. But they but they fervently believe that. But I I, I, I I've been flirting with the idea. Like I haven't been like confident enough in but saying it. But now you it. can. But now the more and more I think about it, the more and more I'm like, yeah, I like the second game a lot. I mean, both are masterpieces, but I still think part two should be taught in schools. It's that good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids, open your controllers to open your controllers. Level 62. I don't know, man. I tried to make it work. I tried to make the joke work. What are some of your hopes for the next season? I don't think we can talk about that as much as I would like. Yeah, because I already know. I already know what. What's All we hope is that it, part. unfortunately for your son <laughs> follows it extremely faithfully yeah. because we do think it is a, a story worth being told. Um, my biggest disappointment in the series is the amount of the amount of uh, infected. And I know we can't just have jump scare after jump scare, but it seems like so much of the landscape that they're just not an issue anymore. Um, and I think that that, I agree with you. They could have used a couple more moments where I really think infective infected would help, especially the episode with David. Um, but I also feel like, it's good and makes sense. It's logical. Like mm-hmm. you, if it, it's been going on for 20 years. There's, there's a finite amount of people and these infected die too. They're organic creatures. Yeah. So it's like, eventually they're, they're not going to be everywhere. They're going to be mostly in cities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I remember, I can't remember where I saw this, but somebody, maybe it was on Twitter, discord or something, but someone was like, I don't understand how this is a po- an apocalyptic show. Because we never see clickers, we never see the infected hardly ever, and when we do see people, they seem to be living just fine. And I kind of really disagree with that, because we see in Kansas City specifically, when the horde comes out, you can see how the world would end from that. Even Infection Day, the very first episode, when we saw a little bit of what happened on Infection Day, you can cl- you can see easily how this would become a awful, awful problem very, very quickly. Yes. And it makes sense that now 20 years on the survivors of that event and who have lived in this world for 20 years are a used to it. B have found a way to keep living through it despite the challenges, but also they're not, people aren't living where they think infected are going to show up. And so that means when the infected do show up, it is a huge big deal and it matters because like, Oh, (laughs) Oh, they've broken through. You know, <laughs> I do agree that we, I would have loved to have seen more of them, but again, I like, especially the last three episodes, we were kind of like, Oh, when are the, when are we going to see more infected? When are we going to see more infected? And all I could think of was like the infected aren't the, they're not part of the story. Like all the things I was thinking of, like if we're going to tell the story of the game, what could they cut and what do they have to keep in? And they would have to have cut all the infected sequences. Because at the end of the day, nothing really narrative happens during those sure. in the latter half of the game. 
that being said, I still would have loved to have seen it because there's such cool zombie designs. That's so cool. Um, but we did get, they did make one little infected scene with Anna in the last episode, but we just want a bloater. Give us another bloater, guys. One thing she said was that uh, maybe Tony took out all these zombies above ground. <laughs> That's why they went underground. There was a lot more in that email. Y'all were making yeah. fun of me, but 25 years ago, I single-handedly stuffed them back in the hole once they came. That was a real pot shot. That was a real pot shot back in... My eyes aren't what they used to be. Speaking of Tony. Oh, Tony's not going to lie to you. Our, uh, we got an email. Where's it at? I was just had it open. I'm an idiot. Oh, this, this comes in from Madison H. Hey, guys. Madison. Just listening to you first thing on Monday morning when you brought up learning the origin of Ellie's knife. Thought you'd find it interesting that there is a graphic novel slash comic called The Last of Us American Dreams written by Neil Druckmann that shows how Ellie and Riley meet. And in it, they interact with Marlene. Marlene eventually gives Ellie the switchblade and said it was Anna's. So this was already canon, not just from the game. Love you guys. And in Disappointed, this season is done. So I won't get to listen to y'all on Mondays. Yellow Jackets is a bit too graphic for me. Though I have to say, I'm happy to have to uh, to not have to hear Tony time again for quite some time. <laughs> Thanks, Madison. Madison, that wounds me. That's a terrible wound terrible that you've wound. created in me. And also, you don't know us at all. If you think we won't bring up Tony as much as we want to, damn it, <laughs> in random properties. We could be talking about Pride and Prejudice and just Tony time. <laughs> oh, look at that hand flex. You think all the emails telling Chris to stop saying any hoozle has stopped him? No. <laughs> we do think we appreciate your support. I'm disappointed we won't have you for the last, uh, excuse me, uh, for Yellow Jackets. Um, I think if you can handle The Last of Us, I think you're good with pretty much anything. But I can't speak to that. You're you. I, and I would say Yellow that Jackets is more Yellow Jackets is gory. body horror yeah, for it's, sure. Yeah, it's, it's far more gory. But I it's think. fun. There's yeah. fun hearts and goos and slices. Fun hearts and goos. <laughs> You're right. It actually. But if, yeah, if, if you don't like Yellow Jackets, again, we're going to be doing some uh, individual films for the next yes. few weeks uh, based off of Chosen by our patrons. Guaranteed Class Action Park will have zero Tony Time references. Wow. Well, ah, I can guarantee I don't that. I don't, <laughs> don't write a check your ass can't catch, my friend. Uh, I built these roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> we. Um, our next Tony email. likes the cup rides at Disneyland. <laughs> uh, our next email comes in from Corey S. Honestly, I really enjoyed this all through. Not a single episode disappointed me in the slightest. Even though I'm doing awesome. a playthrough of the game alongside of the show, I'm still on the very edge of my seat while playing the finale. Or while watching the finale, excuse me. As for my bit of a pills, baby moment. Pills, If you baby. need more Ashley Johnson in your life, she was quite the regular on the NPC drama Blind Spot. Love the pod and how... With my access to Showtime, I can now finally listen to my boys talk some yellow jackets. Hell yeah. That being said, now that by the time you see this will be a week removed from the show, what's your final thoughts on season one of Last of Us and what's your breakout performance of this season? Me personally, all in all, I think it's like a 9.4 out of 10. Phenomenal show. I love it. I love Craig Mason stuff. Um I can't speak to anything specifically, the, but the the overall breakout performance is is Ooh. Bella Ramsey. I think oh, Bella. I had to think about it for a second. I knew what Bella could do. I was pretty sure she was perfectly cast because she was, you know, Liana Mormont. Yeah, for, I'm, what I'm trying to say, what I felt was so perfect about it, like a lady, right? She was 11 years old back then, by the way, but that had moxie. See, she, 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 she would, she would die trying to fight a giant. You know? She has yeah. moxie. <laughs> and, uh, I could see like, oh, that's perfect for Ellie because she like, she's really funny. She's like a really good kid. She likes, you know, she's kind to people, but she also will fucking kill you. Right. Yeah. Uh, how do they cast perfect. for that? And so I was like, that's perfect. Right. But still she shocked me by, um, the emotional depths that she was able to, to go into. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised at how good of that uh, of an actor, how powerful a performance that she gave. So I, I have to give it, I think, to Belly. Uh, be belly. Belly. <laughs> to Belly. <laughs> to Bella. What do you think, Steve? Uh, let's see. Overall, I think I would rate the season an 8.5. I oh, really, really okay. liked it. Yeah, okay. I really liked it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in terms of breakout performance, I think I also have to go with Bella. Like, I know, like, Pedro Pascal is the new hotness, right? But we all knew that Pedro was amazing. Like, I've loved Pedro Pascal since the first time I really kind of took note of him in Game of Thrones. Um, 
But she was, yeah, she was surprising. And this show, actually, there are a lot of really, really great performances that kind of surprised me from um, Javon, who played uh, Sam, uh, and who played his brother, Henry? I forget. I I don't have his name in front of me. Uh, But, uh, oh, Lamar Johnson. And then you have, gosh, you have Melanie Linsky was great in her role. You have Merle Dandridge, who was fucking great as Marlene. Uh, you know, in hindsight, though, I will say that like the one Scott thing Shepard as David was really good. <laughs> David was crazy. Not it was, yeah. it was too good. Nick Offerman surprised the hell out of me. I love Nick Offerman, but I didn't expect just how good he was going to be in the show. I did something being a week removed. One thing I have thought about is like if I was going to change anything, I would I would remove as much as I love her. And I, if you listen to my Yellow Jackets coverage, you know how much I love her. I would remove the Melanie Linsky uh, plot line that they added because then you'd have more time um, for some of the other things that I did want that, you know, that they said they moved along a little too much. Cause I actually, a lot of people rank seven really low left behind uh, in their episode rankings. I've seen that's so surprising. And even a lot of people rank three pretty low too. And they, everybody kind of argues, well, it, it's great. It's beautiful, but it kind of breaks the pace. Right. I disagree. Uh, I think those two episodes are really important for some of the emotional hits that we get yeah, and the themes but I don't think the Kathleen thing really worked the way they wanted it to because they didn't spend the extra time. Um, so if anything, if I had to choose to, to leave that in, but make 10 episodes, I think the show would be almost perfect. Yeah. But if you're going to do nine, take that out and just kill some zombies and shit. Yeah. Cause it I really th- kind of yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then as soon as she died, it was like, Oh, that's over. Like we built up the, what, you know, they kind of, if you'd never played the game, you probably would have thought, she's going to come back in episode eight and, you know, or like, it's going to be a thing. Right? Ah. And I, a lot of people joke every single episode of the show would have been a season of the walking dead. And, uh, <laughs> if you've, yeah. as, a, as a previous fan of that show, that is a hundred percent true. <laughs> they would have so spent true. a whole season and a half in Kansas city. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's funny. Cause you, you are, you bring up a good point because the whole Kansas city escapade was really the only two parter. Don't get hot. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only two parter, which was interesting because in the game, like that's not really like a big story heavy section. You meet Henry and Sam. Now you, you wander you around the thing and you like, kind of wander around on the edge of a lake for a minute. Yeah. You know, remember that where you're going through the boat and stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, it, but it, I think I agree with you, even though like I really liked what they did with their character and like, I love the backstory they kind of added to them. It, it wasn't the most needed thing. I agree. Uh, but I, but I, I agree do, with myself. I do. Really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you do. I do appreciate what they added with uh, Bill. <clears throat> and of course the, the left behind thing has to be in there. I think the left behind episode is incredibly important. Yes, I agree. Um, Cause I've thought about that a lot. I was like, uh, and I, so that that's what came to mind with the week removed thing. Uh, our next email, uh, a quick one comes in from Lauren F. After that amazing finale, I started a rewatch. I've caught some things I missed before. I live in KC. And I noticed they they pass worlds of fun as they're driving into Kansas City. I don't know what that is, but hell yeah for KC in episode four. Pretty cool. It looks so accurately correct for being 2003 when the outbreak started. Also, while watching episode three, I caught myself saying, that's a lot of pills, baby. Pills, baby. Out loud, uh, when Bill puts the pills in the Frank's wine, I was the only one to laugh. <laughs> I like the idea of Lauren being the only streaming things fan. Um, anyway, you guys are awesome. <laughs> love listening to you all. Steve, your Dementor, Sniper Tony, and Dr. B impressions are hilarious. Chris, I love your quick responses and jokes. Um, thank you so much for listening, yeah, Lauren. You. We love that. Well, is Lauren implying that, uh, she said that joke in the discord watch along? Oh, I, don't, I didn't get that idea. I thought she was saying that she said that with like family around or something. Oh, okay. Either way. That's kind of funny. Like pills, baby. And people not in on the joke. Crickets. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I a hundred percent pictured it with like just a bunch of strangers around and she's like going pills, baby. I do that too. Like when I take my vitamins and shit in the morning, my wife doesn't laugh either. So <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, let's see. Which here. by the way, real quick again, Pills Baby is our best-selling shirt ever. So thank you guys who bought a Pills Baby shirt. Tony time is not far behind from what I understand. It's Tony time. Oh, yep. It's Tony time to overtake that bullshit other shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me see here. We're working. It's getting so late. I'm trying to find a shorter email. <laughs> our next email comes in from Hunter L. Hunter L? Hey, y'all. Hi. Long time listener. 
first time emailing. I have thoroughly enjoyed your coverage of the show because I'm a huge fan of these games and a huge fan of their podcast. When y'all covered the finale episode, there was a little bit of a conversation about how the story of Ellie's immunity in the HBO show is not quite canon to the game. This is also a popular opinion uh, through, some of the online, through some of the online discourse. But I have a theory with some supporting evidence that it is canon. This is the email I referenced earlier. What's not canon? Sorry, I missed that first part. The fact that Ellie's immunity is derived... Uh, um, Oh, excuse from me. getting from her mom getting bitten at birth. Yes. Okay. 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 That is canon. Is what uh, Hunter. What's that's what she's saying. Um, so in this section of the game called the Hunt, you can start playing as you start playing as Ellie. Of course, in her backpack she has artifacts like just like Joel does. If you go through her artifacts, there are things in her backpack like the switchblade, the pun joke book, the picture of Joel with his daughter Sarah, um, which we know Ellie gives to Joel toward the. Uh, Joel gets to Ellie towards the end of the game. I think that's what she was trying to say. And there's also a note, or no, she does give it to Joel. That's right. There's also a note from Ellie's mom. You have the option to read the note, and this is what it says. Ellie, this is a quote from the note from the game. Ellie, I'm going to share a secret with you. I'm not a big fan of kids, and I hate babies. And yet, I'm staring at you, and I'm just awestruck. You're not even a day old, and holding you is the most incredible thing I've done in my life. A life that is about to get cut a little short. Marlene will look after you. There's no one in this world I trust more than her. When the time comes, she'll tell you all about me. Don't give her too much of a hard time. Try not to be as stubborn as me. I'm not going to lie. This is a pretty messed up world. It won't be easy. The thing you... <laughs> Why am I crying? I'm a fucking <laughs> loser, dude. <laughs> the thing you always have to remember is no, that... you're great, man. I love that you, you care. <laughs> the thing you always have to remember is that life is worth living. Find your purpose and fight for it. I see so much strength in you. I know you'll turn out to be the woman you're meant to be forever. Your loving mother, Anna. Make me proud, Ellie. Uh, in my opinion, the most important part of this letter to Ellie is the second line. You're not even a day old and holding you is the most incredible thing I've done in my life. A life that is about to get cut a little short. We can infer two things from this line. Number one, of course, Ellie was just born less than 24 hours ago. Two, Anna knows her life is about to be cut short, inferring that she was bitten by an infected and she's taking the time to write the letter before giving Ellie to Marlene. We know that when someone is bitten, they don't turn into infected right away. They can sometimes have up to two days of quote unquote normalcy before officially turning, even though the letter doesn't explicitly say so. It's very easy to assume that Anna was bitten bitten while pregnant with Ellie or when she or she was bitten before she could cut the umbilical cord like in the HBO series. Neil Druckmann is very intentional with his story writing. This letter is in the game is specific about Ellie just being born and he hints that Anna was bitten. So to me, it can't just be a coincidence. I would love to hear your all's thoughts. Happy streaming. Hunter, I think that's brilliant. I'm right there with you. I agree. I agree. I don't I uh, I 100% agree. I in the moment when we recorded last week, I did, I didn't remember this letter in particular, but it has since been brought to my attention. It's like, oh yeah, I do remember that. Cool. Yeah. But I agree with you completely. I think that's definitely inferred. And I love that we got to see it in the show. Like that's really cool. It's what like, it was one of our favorite uh, moments of that whole uh, episode. And even the whole series for me personally, I love that scene. Letter baby. <laughs> letter. Uh, our next email comes from, from Megan W. Hey guys. Hi. I've been with you for only a year now and I continue coming back. <laughs> been with us only a year. I don't know why you're coming back, but we love it that you do. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> I now hope for new shows just so I can hear you guys break it down. A episode nine, you guys talk about how the fireflies are the bad guys and couldn't realistically make a cure. Did we talk about Did this? we talk about that? I we talked remember. about how people believe that, I think. But even realistically in today's world, cures don't always work or need multiple test subjects. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, we don't know if Joel 100% believed a cure could be made or even the Fireflies think that. We do know that. We do know that the Fireflies think that. That's from Neil Druckmann, the creator. He has said they do believe that. Mm -hmm. uh, they are they do think that they're the good guys, right? For sure. That's what he has said. So it's a maybe. Ellie would be killed and maybe they would have a cure. I don't think it's fair to put that on her, especially for a maybe. Also, yes, Ellie wanted to be part of finding a cure. But would she have wanted to if she knew she would have to die? Maybe before the trip, but maybe she didn't want to lose Joel just as Joel didn't want to lose her. I don't know. I definitely couldn't kill any child for a maybe. Definitely not my child. Somebody else's maybe. I think. <laughs> you know what I mean? Somebody else's kid? Sure. I don't yeah. know, kid. Hey, remember... uh. Uh, Carl's kid. Oh, Carl's kid. We might be able to get a cure out of him. Oh yeah. Try that. Well, here's the thing you got to know. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. Maybe cure. Carl's kid sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that kid, that kid eats his boogers. Yeah, sure. Do whatever it. you want. I'm just going to say it. we're all, listen, we're all thinking it. <laughs> no one's brave enough to say it, but that kid, 
Total dud. Mm-hmm. Total dud. Listen, we're all thinking it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Quote, unquote, cure him. Or wait, whatever you said. Do it. Um, much love, McDubs. <laughs> P.S. McDubs. Can't wait to get my pills, baby sweater. Uh, you got oh, sweater? I'm so excited for you, Megan. Yeah. P.P.S. Pedro is daddy. I get it. I'm right yeah. there with you. Daddy. Would love to hear you guys talk about the movie, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. I would love Wonderful to do that. Wonderful movie. I love that movie. Hey, any of you patrons out there, request that one. Yeah, please let us let us record an I'm episode re- on that. I'm ready to watch it again. And if you if you guys are listening, you haven't even heard of this movie, just run it blindly. You, uh, you, you'll, you'll love it. I guarantee it. Guarantee it. <laughs> guarantee. Tell them Nick Cage, smooch is good. <laughs> <laughs> our next email comes in from Catherine b viewer who didn't play the game is the subject line hello hello i like to pretend she might be russian hello uh thank you for your coverage of the show this season being able to listen to first thing on monday morning ease my grief for the ending of each episode i did not play the game but i was aware it was a game before watching that's good enough yeah. i found each episode deeply affecting and cried at some point in all eight episodes um that is, i think there's nine there's, that is definitely a first for me. Hearing this story after living through a pandemic changes my experience. I was cynical from the beginning about the possibility of a vaccine being effective because of the clusterfuck we experienced with supply and distribution of the COVID vaccine. I think, Steve, I think you touched on this earlier when I a talked about bit, a little bit. Everybody thinking, they were, everything, everybody thinking they were experts. You're like, well, after the COVID, it's kind of like that we are, right? And that's fair. And a societal collapse, I think it would be nearly impossible to distribute this vaccine in any kind of meaningful way. Maybe it was that experience or because I'm a parent myself, but I can understand Joel's choice to abandon. We have not got a single email uh, that fucking killer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we've all been thinking it. She kind of sucks. She keeps drinking up those jokes. Are just terrible. Jokes. Boo. <laughs> Hate them. <laughs> Who likes giraffes? She beat up Jessica or whatever that girl's name was. <laughs> you know what's cool? Horses. I like, I do like horses. Not giraffes. Not giraffes. Bullshit. Um, but I can understand Joel's toys to abandon humanity in favor of saving <laughs> Ellie. What makes Joel the villain for me is the lie. He is brave enough to kill dozens of innocent people, people who could potentially heal the world, but not yeah. brave enough to own his choice for Ellie. Absolutely. I'd like to know more, more from people who played the game, how the vaccine was discussed in the game. Did you know while you were playing that Ellie's life was in the, uh, was the answer? No. Did you get a sense that Ellie knew she would have to die for the cure? No, I'm not sure they, I'm, that's me answering. Uh, I'm not sure they captured that in the show. Anyway, this is the best TV I've ever watched. So I've decided to play part two to keep the story going. Ooh, Ooh please follow up with us on that. Have fun. Um, it's dark. No, at the same point of the story in the game, you get that same kind of, what do you mean you're going to kill her? You know? Yeah. And in fact, they originally planned to have that be an extended cut scene um, and decided to make a gameplay. I so. think I think making a gameplay is good for the medium of a video game because oh, you, yeah. you really feel as the player like I don't want to be killing these guys and it's really hard it like you hard. die a bunch playing that part of the game yeah um uh, so uh oh I totally lost my train of thought there was something I wanted to speak to in there but I but I really really like what uh what she said about uh Joel not being brave enough to tell her the truth because he knows that if he tells her the truth he there's a good chance that she would think less of him. At the very least. Yes. And he could possibly lose her if he told her the truth. And um, uh, that is a really, really good point. It's one of my favorite things about the relationship. And that feeds into the, the scene I talked about earlier about how she knows that he's lying to him. And it's just like, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, like I, it is funny that like no one has emailed in defense of the Fireflies. In terms of the game, like the vaccine being... Um, implemented you're right there isn't a good infrastructure to administer a vaccine to all these roaming bands of people that are about but the point is you have it and you can create it and then it'll be a very slow process you touched on it earlier chris it's like it's something that would take a couple generations to probably have a significant impact Mm -hmm. but at least it's there and humanity isn't doomed to slowly die a thousand cuts right or like band against each other until we all die Bear down, uh, if you will. A bear down, as one would. Um, 
So I like no, like if the game doesn't actually say how they're gonna do, I don't even know if the game even calls it a vaccine. I think the game just calls it a cure. Like it's very yeah. vague. I think in the game, yes, because this was before COVID, before like vaccine was like a hot button word. Yes, um, this is before we knew. Never mind. <laughs> what? I know I was gonna say something a politically charged joke. Oh, okay. I'm gonna leave it off. How about oh, okay. That? I'm growing up. You are growing. I'm maturing. I'm maturing. Look at us. <laughs> Look at us. Bear down. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it, pussy. <laughs> Tony, Tony, back up. I like I like the old Chris. He would say it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> um. I forget I interrupted you. I hope we were done. Oh, I was done. Okay. I was done. <laughs> I just want to read a quick thing from Emily S. I think it's awesome. Emily. Um, she says a lot of good stuff, but I thank you for the podcast. My sister, Jenny, and I are loyal listeners and are even going back and rewatching Stranger Things to get caught up on the pod from the beginning. Oh, good God luck with those early episodes. Godspeed. I look forward to my three time a week listens, Last of Us, Yellow Jackets, and Stranger Things rewatch, and all the laughs you guys give me. Keep it up. Heart emoji. Emily S., Hashtag sniper Tony for life. Yeah. Uh, I just love the idea of two sisters enjoying the show together. Like that's sister, that's sister, neat. just like, or any family members, just like, just listen to the show. Like just sharing that bond. You I'm know? actually happy to hear that someone listens to all three episodes each week. Cause that is like a minor fear in my brain. Like, are we putting out too much content? So like knowing someone well, actually, she's actually even it they're all. going back for more with the stranger things and more. In addition. <laughs> <laughs> more. more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wonder, uh, I hope the yellow jackets listenership picks up uh, because that show is a gem. And um, I know some of the shows we cover, that's always a fear of ours. Like, Hey, maybe nobody gives a fuck yeah. about this show that we're going into now and we'll lose half our listeners. And that's but, why it's so hard. Cause a lot of people do message us. And they're like, Oh, you should cover this show. You should cover that show. And it is a balancing act because we're trying to pick the shows that are A, right for our audience, but B, can potentially grow it. I would do all six seasons of Lost. Yeah. I've we never get that seen one the, all the time. I've never seen the fucking show. It's a great show. But it's like, is that going to drop our listenership to 400 people? Because <laughs> like a lot of emails and DMs is still ultimately like 400 people, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, that, that. that's why we pick stuff like House of the Dragon, um, even Ring the Power was like relatively low listenership, even though we thought that would be a huge show. Yeah. And we killed ourselves doing that alongside House of the Dragon. Yeah. For essentially not no reason, because some people get a lot of value out of that. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we got a lot of value, but it was like it wasn't we didn't have as great a return on our investment that we were hoping and then, for. And, and, you know, we want to ultimately please our core audience the most. But it's like, so why do you care about, you know, the most listeners possible? It's like, well, the more support that we have, the more likely we can do this full time and then you can't fucking imagine the amount of content we could make if we can, <laughs> if you and i could do this like 40 hours a week like no real job to keep us no other job i should say no real job no other job to keep us from doing this constantly yeah lord we would be doing shows on the mandalorian right now succession probably yep. ted would, lasso we would yeah ted lasso we'd, we'd be doing all those but uh, we're we're we are just two men living our lives and we need to put roofs over our heads. So until then we have to you know, do what we can. And that's why we're very selective with what we choose to uh, record on. Yeah. Right now it's like we all watch whatever we got to watch, which is usually five or six hours of TV and movies like Friday and Saturday separately and with our families, unless there's a, an episode to watch together. Um, and then we, Steve and I get together 10 hours on Sunday and yeah. sit and record all the episodes for the week. And then he edits them all night. And gets up and goes to work. I get up and go to work. And, you know, and then I come home and fucking make TikTok videos and YouTube videos and shit. And run the Discord and the Patreon page. Yeah. And, like, there's a lot for this, the two of us. Um, but all I, I know, I don't know how I went off on this tangent again. I did. <laughs> but, I, like, I guess I really just feel sadness inside. Like, I really want to watch all the stuff that you guys are asking us to watch. And, I, uh, yeah. you know, because we get tons of DMs and stuff. Like, where's the Andor episode? And where's this oh, episode? Dude, I'm nothing like, would make me happier than if we were covering Mandalorian at the same time as it, all this. It, like, it hurts me um, mm -hmm. deeply. I think we need to wrap it up. A terrible wound. I think I'm, I'm going to call it. There's tons more emails, but I, I'm tired. I'm going to call it. I love you guys. Thank you so much for writing in so many good emails. I hope I wasn't too harsh. Like, cause I've been in the trenches with some last of us discourse <laughs> for like a couple <laughs> weeks now. And a lot of you die hard game because I didn't play the game until like six months ago, but a lot of you die hard game fans have been like, fuck you, buddy. I've been in the trenches talking about this shit for 10 years. And it's like, that's fair. That's fair. Um, but I think 
I've heard a lot of the same stuff. So you know, I hope I didn't come off too harshly about certain things because I, mm-hmm. you guys are all so kind, so supportive. Yeah, we love you guys so the much. The fact that you would take the time to send an email to me about this stuff, it, it, I never take for granted. I think that's great. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you to the mods running the Discord so beautifully. I love you all. That's all the time we have for right now. My name is Chris. And I'm Steve. And this is Streaming Things. Happy streaming. There are, there are other things that can go on tangents, but it's late. We got to wrap it up. That's the last of things. That's the last of things. <laughs> Come on, Eddie. <laughs> we got to go find the fireflies. What are you doing? I heard you like dinosaurs. <laughs> I'm going to play that. I know giraffes are kind of like dinosaurs. <laughs> kind of. They're tall. I'm going to play that Radiohead song real quick. If I ever were to lose you, <laughs> <laughs> I'd surely lose myself. You're making fun of me, Sam. <laughs> oh, it's Sniper Tone here, and I've been instructed by the boys via radio to read you the brand new patrons in the month of March. These are people who have an extra set of mirth in their hearts. And they are truly the last line of defense between streaming things and a total economic collapse. So in the Try Before Deny section, I want to thank Luke and Sarah, Conrad and Trey Barrera. In the Marty B VIP section, we're, we're thanking Tamara. Oh, oh Tony's going to mispronounce this one, that's for sure. J- Jir Latanowitz. Oh, I mispronounced that just like I misfire my rifle. Brianna Bernard, we thank you. Elizabeth Palmer, Josh Stitch, and John Ricker. Oh, thank you all so much. In the chocolate pudding producer sections, we have Lair Gillis, Maha Axholt. I probably missed that one too. Uh, Thank you to Jordan C., Kelly Shartner, Natalie Cleland, Sonny. Oh, it has not been sunny here in quite some time. Thank you to Wayne Yopst. Oh, I think the world has passed Tony by. Tony does not know what that word is. Yopst. Uh, thank you to Shotzi, Brock Borick, Alicia Takahashi, Gabe, Quentin Vassa, Teresa Schwimmer, and Rob Westendorf. And last but not least, we have our friends don't lie to thank. Those friends are Taj Ala, and Melissa Worcester. You know what old Tone used to shoot a war, a, win, a Worcester back in his day? Or was it a Winchester? I don't know. I'm Sniper Tone. My mind is frail. I got to get back to protecting Kansas City. What? It's already on fire. Oh, Tony, you done it again.